The Fog by James Herbert Read by Christopher Lee Chapter 1 The village slowly began to come to life. Slowly, because nothing ever happened with speed in that part of Wiltshire. Newcomers welcomed the leisurely pace and protective quiet of the village. The occasional tourist, delighted in its weathered charm, then moved on, a little afraid of the boredom it might bring. Jessie opened her grocery shop at precisely 8.30, as she had been doing for the past 20 years. Even when Tom, her late husband, had died, the shop had still been opened on the dot of 8.30. Her first customer was Mrs. Thackeray, who had been a great comfort since Tom had died and never missed her morning cup of tea with Jessie. She waved to Mr. Papworth, the butcher across the street, who was sweeping the pavement man, Mr. Papworth, much nicer since his wife had left him after six years of marriage, and she hadn't been his sort anyway. Much too young for him, too flighty. Still, all that was in the past. It was becoming more frequent, and the whole village knew that the butcher's and grocery shop would eventually become a combined family business. There was no rush. Things would take their course. Good morning, Mrs. Bandock said two young voices in unison. She smiled down at little Freddy Gravies and his small sister, Clara. I'm surprised to see you two today. Saturday's usually your pocket money day, isn't it? Yes, but we polished all Daddy's boots yesterday, so he gave us a spate, was Freddy's reply. Their father was a policeman who adored his two children but dealt with them strictly. Well, what are you going to buy? Jesse asked, knowing that they couldn't have much to spend. Clara pointed to the penny chews, and Freddy nodded in agreement. Three each, please, he said. Well, now, penny chews are cheaper on Mondays. You get four each for 6p today. They beamed up at her as she took out the sweets. Thank you, said Clara as she put them in her pocket. Freddy gave Jessie the money, and they ran from the shop, Freddy clutching Clara's hand. Morning, Jessie, it was the postman. Hello, Tom, something for me? Air mail. Suspect it's from your boy, he replied, handing her the blue and red envelope. Been in the army nearly a year now, isn't he? She nodded a little sadly as she began to read the letter. Oh, well, Jesse, a young boy like Andy couldn't stay cooped up in a village like this all his life, could he? Having the time of his life now, I reckon. Yes, I suppose you're right, but I do miss him. He was a good boy. The postman shrugged his shoulders. Well, must be off, Jesse. Yes, bye, Tom. A smile spread across her face as she went on reading, and his natural boisterousness shone through the written words. She felt giddy and lurched against the counter, alarmed at the strange stomach-rising feeling. Then she heard a deep rumbling noise from below, under her feet, and the floor began to quiver. The rumbling grew louder, deeper. Now the whole shop seemed to be moving. The large glass window cracked and then fell in. Shelves collapsed. The noise became deafening. Jessie screamed. She stumbled, then crawled towards the doorway, terror of the building collapsing in on her, forcing her on. Vibrations ran through her body, at times the shaking almost making her lose contact with the floor. She reached the door and looked out at the road that ran through the village. The postman stood in the middle of the road, holding onto his bike. A huge crack appeared at his feet, and suddenly, as the ground opened up, he disappeared. The crack snaked along the length of the street to where young Freddy and Clara stood transfixed, and on towards Mrs. Thackeray, who had been making her way to Jessie's shop. Then the road disappeared, as the ground opened up like a gigantic, yawning mouth. As Jessie looked, she just caught sight of a terrified face of Mr. Papworth, as he and the whole row of shops and houses on his side were swallowed up by the earth. Chapter 2 Wearily changed gear to take the car around the bend in the narrow country road. He was unshaved and his clothes were still damp from the morning dew. He'd spent half the night trying to sleep inside a thicket of sight of the army patrols that practiced a wooded part of Salisbury Plain. The area was owned by the Ministry of Defence, and trespassers were severely dealt with if caught. Homan shook his head in disgust at the danger and discomfort he'd had to go through to maintain secrecy when he himself worked for the same government. It was idiotic, 
that the two departments, the Ministry of Defence and the Department of the Environment, couldn't work hand in hand. From polluted rivers to outbreaks of disease, it was a special unit because nearly all the investigations were carried out secretly. If a company was suspected of illegally dumping dangerous waste product, be it into the sea, into a river, or onto a tip, but no proof could be found by direct methods, then Homan was sent in to probe further. He usually worked alone and often under a cover. His one big frustration was that the transgressions he unearthed were not always acted upon. When politics, business, or governmental became involved, he knew the chances of prosecution against the offenders were slim. At 32, Homan was still young enough to be angered by that fact. However, he would also be quite unscrupulous in achieving his aims and more than once had caused alarm among the few superiors who knew about his activities. At the moment, his project was to investigate land owned by the Ministry of Defence, used by them as a training ground for the army. Homan knew that much of it was going to waste, areas of great natural beauty, rich arable soil being allowed to spoil. The Ministry of Defence was holding tightly on to over 750,000 acres for training or test purposes, and his department suspected that only a fraction of it was necessary. So Homan had been given the job of seeing just how much land was being used, and if for valid purposes. He had spent two rigorous days dodging patrols, taking photographs, gathering information about the enormous woodland area owned by the Ministry on Salisbury Plain. Had he been caught, the consequences could have been quite severe but he knew the risk involved and enjoyed the element of danger. Now, as he rounded the bend, he saw a village ahead. Maybe he could get some breakfast here, he thought. He drew nearer and suddenly became aware of a strange vibration running through the car, then of a deep rumbling noise. A gigantic crack appeared directly ahead of him, then grew long up, and they disappeared. Through his horror, he realized that the ground below his car was beginning to split. He opened the door, but too late. The car began to fall, and Homan was trapped inside. After a few sickening seconds, the car became wedged, and he found himself pressed up against the steering wheel, staring down into a frightening black void. Slowly, his brain began to function. He must be at the end of the opening, where the sides were narrowest. If it widened further, the car would plunge into the black depths below, Panic drove him into action. He frantically pushed himself away from the steering wheel, but the sudden movement caused the car to slide a terrifying two feet farther down. More cautiously, he began to edge himself over into the back seat. He froze as the car shifted again, but this time the movement was fractional. He wound down a rear side window and saw that there was just sufficient gap between the car and the side of the chasm for him to see through. He scrambled through and clung to the crumbling wall of rock and earth for a full five minutes. Then he looked around him fearfully. From the jagged outline above, he guessed the eruption was at least 500 yards long. The side seemed steady now, although earth still showered down into what seemed a bottomless pit. He heard a sudden cry and saw a tiny figure lying on a narrow ledge about 50 feet away. It was the little girl he'd seen in the street above. Of the boy who'd been with her, there was no sign. She began to whimper piteously. Homan called out to her, then looked around. The problem was to get across the gorge to her, and quickly. The car would have to act as a bridge. Before allowing himself to think further, he put his foot on the roof and took two bounds across the gap. But the second step caused the car to slip down, taking Homan with it. Desperately, he grabbed at a dead tree root, and it swung him inwards. Homan managed to find a handhold, then raised his feet until they found a more solid rest. Gulping in lungfuls of dusty air, he looked towards the little girl. He knew she would not last long on the precarious ledge. Again, the thought of the ground closing up drove him on, and he inched forward. He felt his way along carefully, and as he drew nearer, the child's sobbing stopped and she looked up at him, a tiny face, a mask of sheer horror. It's okay, it's okay, he said, softly but urgently. I'm coming to help you. Don't move. She began to back away and slid down suddenly. Homan took a chance and lurched forward, hoping the side of the ledge would hold his weight. His left hand found a crevice in the wall, and he clung to it grimly, stretching out his other hand to the girl. She was screaming now, but her hand grabbed his as she realized the danger.
Hold on to me, sweetheart, he told her gently. Put your arms around my neck and hold tight. He pulled her down between the ledge and his body, telling her to put her legs around his waist. Numbly, she complied, her short legs resting on his hips. Now don't let go and everything will be fine, he whispered, easing himself back along the crack to the more solid outcrop of rock. He sank to his knees, still holding the child close, exhausted. After a few minutes, he began to wonder at what had happened, what had caused it. It certainly wasn't any gas mains explosion, not with this devastation. The hole was too deep, too long. No, it must have been an earth tremor. But why? Had the nearby military installation been testing some underground explosives? Well, probably it had nothing to do with them. It was more likely to be a freak of nature, a disturbance below that had been building up for centuries. But still, the doubt lingered. Just then... Homan noticed a yellowish mist slowly rising in a sluggish, swirling motion. As it covered the girl's head, she started to cough. Then the mist reached his nostrils. It had a slightly acidy smell to it, unpleasant, but not choking. It was above his head now, and he found it difficult to see through. It was like a fog. His horror grew. Somehow it seemed evil and sinister. He didn't know why, but it filled him with a sense of foreboding. Help! Is there anybody up there? Can anyone hear me? There was no answer. The child burst into tears again, burying her head into his shoulder. Moving her around to his back, he began to climb. The people above heard the cry for help. They gained new heart at the sound of a voice, a chance to react against the tragedy. The policeman, whose children were thought to have been lost in the eruption, was lowered over the edge of the crack. When he emerged, five minutes later, he held a small, unconscious girl in his arms. He laid her on the ground, then dashed back to the hole and was lowered again. This time he brought up a man. A man covered from head to foot with dust and dirt. A man who gibbered and screamed. A man who had to be restrained by four others from running back and throwing himself into the black depths. A man who was insane. The villagers watched the mist rising from the hole to form a heavy yellowish cloud. Then the winds blew it away moving it in a huge, almost solid-looking mass across the sky, away from the ruined village. Chapter 3 The Reverend Martin Hurdle trudged across the fields, his thoughts on the peaceful little village that had virtually been demolished by the freak earthquake. It had been the main story in the newspapers all that week. He shrugged his shoulders helplessly. He usually enjoyed his early Sunday morning walk across the fields, planning his sermon, but he supposed the tragedy of the eruption still bore heavily on him. He'd driven to the village to try to help, to administer the last rites to the dying, to comfort the injured. He looked up from the ground abruptly, realizing he'd walked into a mist. It had a yellowish tinge to it and was suddenly very thick as it swept over him. Strange smell, too. Goodness, he thought. Better retrace my steps and get clear of this. He walked back in the direction he'd come, for some reason becoming nervous as his steps didn't bring him clear of the dense mist. No, it, it wasn't a mist, he thought. It was fog, as bad as some of the old London pea supers. Goodness, he muttered aloud. I'm lost. What was that? His heart pounded as a dark, nebulous shape approached him, followed by another. Then he laughed. He had walked into a herd of cows. It took him a full five minutes to recover his wits, frightened by a herd of cows. He'd certainly learned a lesson today. The unknown was always more fearful than the reality. It took him another 20 minutes to find his way clear of the fog. The man crouched low in the bushes when he heard a rustle of leaves to his left. 
human or animal. Tom Abbott had to be careful. If he was caught poaching on Colonel Meredith's land again, he'd be in serious trouble. Last time the Colonel had spotted him hiding in the bushes and used his thick walking stick to beat him about the head and shoulders. The poacher crept forward again, still cursing the landowner in his mind, peering into the bushes ahead. He froze. Yes, there was something there, and not a man. Another pheasant, I'll warrant, Tom told himself. He kept perfectly still, not wanting to frighten it away, to let it come out in its own time. He crouched there for a full ten minutes before he became aware of a solid blanket of fog almost on top of him. Soon he was completely enveloped in it. Then he heard the sound of something scampering away. He cursed aloud and stood up. Ah, oh, well, one was better than nothing. He walked back through the fog. He knew the area so well he could find his way back blindfold. The Sunday morning service began as normal, pleasurable to some, boring others, but today, because of the tragedy, meaningful for most. A few people near the front noticed the vicar occasionally put his hand to his forehead as though he were tired or had a headache, but the service continued smoothly enough until the sermon. Then the Reverend Martin Hurdle, vicar of St. Augustine's for 18 years, lifted his cassock and exposed himself to his congregation. Now where have all those blessed cows got to? George Ross, a farmer, asked himself aloud. He stood looking around, then his mouth dropped open at the sight of the fog at the other end of his field. Well, I'll be. Never noticed that. He began to walk towards the murky cloud and grinned as he saw the cows emerging from it. Trust you, he shouted at them. Stupid bloody creatures. Funny having a fog down here, he pondered. Too heavy to be a mist. All this blooming pollution. The cows were up to him now and the leaders passed him. And suddenly they all stopped and turned towards him, watching. Watch this then. For some inexplicable reason, he had begun to feel nervous. Then they began to close in on him. He heard a pounding of hooves and felt himself pushed from behind. He fell to the ground and scrambled about on his hands and knees, trying to rise. He began to scream as the cows started to kick him. They were racing round him, their eyes bulging almost out of their sockets, froth and slime running from their mouths. Then they began to bite him, snapping off his fingers, as he raised his arms to protect himself. When at last he lay sprawled semi-conscious, they heard it together and crushed the life from his battered body with their hooves. The poacher gazed at the colonel's huge country home from his hiding place in the bushes. After a while, he rose and crept stealthily towards a wooden hut at the end of the long garden. He pushed open the door, his eyes now developing a fixed stare, his movements controlled, steady. He reached for an axe, rusted with time, but the blade still sharp. As he turned to leave the hut, his gaze fell on a box of three-inch nails used for fencing. He put some of them in his pocket. He walked back up the garden in a straight line towards the house, not bothering to hide. As he reached the back door, the Meredith's cook was just opening it to let the steam from her kitchen escape. She had no chance to scream before the axe hit her, for in the next instant she was dead. Tom Abbott climbed the stairs to the hall, and the sound of voices drew him towards the dining room. He stood still when he heard footsteps. The maid hummed to herself as she descended the stairs. Put the kettle on, Mrs. Peabody, she called out as she approached the kitchen door. Discovering the kitchen empty, she looked around curiously. She walked to the open door. 
and a scream broke from her lips as she saw the cook's body lying there just outside the doorway, its skull cleaved open to the bridge of the nose. As she collapsed, the maid's brain just registered the other scream, the scream from upstairs that pierced the still air. When she regained consciousness, she ran to the dining room, trying to call out. There, she stopped short at the sight confronting her. Her mistress lay sprawled on the floor in a pool of blood, and the colonel lay spread-eagled on the huge dining table, long nails through the palms of his hands and the flesh of his ankles to pin him there. A man stood over him, an axe dripping with blood in his hands. The maid was unable to move with the horror of it. She saw the man raise the axe above his head and bring it down with all his strength, severing a hand. By the time he'd cut off the other hand, the colonel was unconscious. By the time he'd hacked off both feet, the colonel was dead. The maid finally began to scream. When the man with the axe turned his head and looked at her. Chapter Four. Hello, John. John Homan smiled up at the girl. Hello, Casey. He was sitting on the steps of the hospital, unwilling to wait inside. He found hospitals depressing. They said you'd need at least another couple of weeks. She sat next to him on the steps. No, I'm all right now. Any longer in there and I'd have gone mad again. She flinched at the words, remembering how he had been the first time she'd visited. He hadn't been the man she knew and loved. He was an animal, a foul-mouthed, raging animal tied to a bed. Casey had left in a daze, tears blurring her vision. Casey's wretchedness had increased that evening when she visited home and again. The doctor felt that she should know about the young child rescued with him who had died that afternoon without ever coming out of the unusual coma she'd been in since the eruption. They now thought that she had been affected by gas released from below the ground. It was possible that Homan also had been affected, and this in some strange way was the cause of his madness. The next few days would tell if the brain damage was permanent or would pass, or if the effects were fatal. She hardly slept that night. She had known Herman for nearly a year now and was becoming aware that she would be lost without him. But when she returned to the hospital in the morning, dread in her heart, Herman was completely sane, weak, ashen-faced, but totally sane. And one week later... He was ready to go home. Now, sitting beside him, Casey took Homan's hand and asked, Are you sure it's all right for you to leave the hospital so soon? Oh, they wanted me to stay, but I've had enough. Yesterday, Spires came down to interrogate me. Spires was Homan's immediate boss at his ministry. What did he want to know? asked Casey. Whether I'd completed my weekend's assignment. He couldn't tell her that Spires had come to find out if he had found any evidence that could connect the earthquake with experiments being carried out on the military base. Homan thought it unlikely and had no such proof anyway. I've got to report to him tomorrow. Then I'm on a week's leave. I should think so too, after all you've been through. Yes, but honestly, I feel fine now. Uh, now, come on, let's leave before I go out of my mind again. He laughed at her frown. It was just before Way Hill that they ran into the fog again. Strange, said Homan, stopping the car. Is it smoke or just a mist? Oh, it's too heavy for mist, replied Casey. It's fog. It's creepy. They both jumped as a school bus sped past them, heading towards Way Hill. Bloody fool, muttered Homan. He's heading right into it. They watched as it was swallowed up by the fog. They suddenly realized the fog had crept much nearer to them. Christ, it moved fast, said Homan. Come on, then, it'll be okay if I take it easy. He drove on, and very soon they entered the fog. As the slightly acrid smell reached Homan's nostrils, a tiny nerve twitched in his memory cells. He broke into a cold sweat and stopped the car. 
What's the matter, John? Casey asked, alarmed. Why, I don't know. The fog, it seems familiar. John, the papers said a cloud of dust or smoke came from the eruption. They thought it had been caused by a blast beneath the ground. Perhaps this is it. Well, maybe it is, but let's try and get clear. He edged the car forward, peering ahead into the gloom. They'd made a hundred yards slow progress when they came upon the school bus lying half in a ditch. Homan climbed out of the car, telling Casey to remain inside. The slight but distinct odour of the fog disturbed him again as he closed the car door behind him. Is anyone hurt? he asked the spectral shape of the man he assumed was the boy's master. I'm afraid our driver suffered nasty blow on the head, said the teacher. Well, let's have a look at him, said Homan. Maybe I can help. They walked to the front of the coach where they found the driver sitting on the grass. Some boys stood around him, watching curiously. Now, Mr. Hodges, um, how are we feeling? asked the teacher. Bloody awful, came the muffled reply. The boys tittered, and the teacher ordered them to go to the back of the coach and stay out of the road. Homan looked carefully at the gash on the driver's head. He turned to the teacher. I don't think it's serious, but we'll take him to a doctor and inform the police at the same time. They'll arrange other transport for the boys. Are any of them hurt? Um, no, they're all right, thank you. As they helped the injured Hodges back to the car, the teacher explained the coach journey. We're from Redbrook House, a private boarding school in Andover. We're on our way back from a nature ramble on the plain, you know. I cannot imagine where this fog came from. Homan cast an anxious eye around him. The fog seemed as dense as ever. As they approached the car, Casey opened her door. Don't get out, he shouted. He opened the door on his side and helped the injured man to climb into the back. And then he turned to the teacher. If I were you, I'd get all those boys back into the coach and keep the doors and windows closed. I'll get someone back to you as soon as possible, so just sit tight. As Homan cautiously moved off, he still wasn't quite sure why he was so uneasy about the fog. The doctors had said his breakdown could have been caused in some way by released gas from the cracked earth, and that smell had seemed familiar somehow. He slowed to crawling pace as the fog became thicker. John, what's that? I thought I saw something white shining through the fog, but it vanished almost immediately, said Casey. Their passenger suddenly said, Nice peaceful summer we had, I don't think. Bloody earthquake of all things, here in Wiltshire. He groaned in pain, and then his voice rose. And then yesterday, do you hear about the axe murders? Happened fairly near the earthquake village and all. Colonel something or other murdered with his wife and all his staff, cook and a maid. Done it with an axe, and the bloke got done it chopped at his own wrists until he bled to death. Hodges groaned again. How much further? For another slow 15 minutes, they were immersed in the dense fog, and then suddenly they were clear. Homan picked up some speed. The village police station was soon reached. The police sergeant couldn't quite understand Homan's anxiety when he learned that none of the boys was seriously hurt, and he was almost disbelieving about the fog. Nevertheless, he said he would send one of his men out there right away. When Homan left the police station, he had a faint feeling of dissatisfaction. Now that he was in the bright sunshine, the fog seemed unreal, as though it had never really happened. Was his mind still a bit disturbed? Did he really think this fog had something to do with his own recent illness? Homan shrugged off his thoughts and drove the still grumbling Hodges to the doctor's surgery. There they left him, and then drove on to London. Chapter 5 a few hours later, they reached Homan's flat in St. John's Wood Road. Casey made him a coffee while he slumped in a chair. How do you feel now, John? she asked gently. Oh, a little tired, that's all. Post-hospital depression, I think it's called. After a pause, she said, I discovered a lot of things about myself when you were in hospital, John. The most important being that I love you more than I could have imagined possible. He leaned closer to her, taking her face in his hands, saying nothing. The way you wear, she continued, things you said, it frightened me. 
It was like a nightmare. And then I went back to the hospital the next day, and they told me that you might die. I realized I'd be nothing without you. I don't want to leave you. Let me stay for at least tonight, she begged. He kissed her lips, suddenly laughing at her sorrowful face. <laughs> okay, Casey, he said, you've got a deal. Gradually, Herman began to relax. He looked down at her and said suddenly, let's go to bed. Herman strolled along Marsham Street, enjoying the bustle. He entered the gloom of the large environment building and took the lift to the eighth floor. Hello, John. His colleague McLennan, a cheerful Scot with only a trace of accent, greeted him. Spires wants to see you as soon as possible. I'm glad you're okay, by the way. You take it easy. Sure, Mac, thank you. Herman climbed the stairs to the ninth floor to Spires' office. Spires looked up from his papers, peering at him through thick lensed glasses. Ah, John, feeling okay? Good. Now, first, I'd like you to tell me again about the earthquake, right from the beginning. Herman told as much as he could remember, but his mind went blank at the point where he had rescued the girl. Spires leaned forward. Think, John, did you hear an explosion before the ground opened? You see, he said, a cloud of smoke was reported rising up out of the ground just after they'd brought you up. You think there was an explosion then? I didn't hear one. Possibly. Connected with a military base? Certainly not. The Ministry of Defence would never be as irresponsible as to have caused a disaster like this. You suspect something, don't you? He asked Spires quietly. Spires spoke wearily. Look, I've been on to the Ministry of Defence. There is a massive clamped down in security. I don't know if it means anything, and I'm powerless if it does. A strange, vacant look came into his eyes, and his voice trailed off. What's wrong? Homan asked, concerned. What? He broke off as Spires rose from his chair, walked to the window, and opened it. He turned to look at the surprised younger man, then he climbed onto the sill. Before Homan could make a move towards him, he jumped out. Homan was stunned. Then, shouting Spire's name, he rushed to the window. He saw the crumpled figure lying on the pavement nine floors below, a pool of blood spreading swiftly from beneath the smashed head. Homan drew in a long, uneven breath. He turned back in towards the room and saw Spire's secretary standing in the doorway, a frightened look on her face. He... He jumped, Herman managed to say at last. Herman sank into the chair Spires had occupied only moments ago and sat staring at the desktop. What had happened? Why had he jumped? The feeling came over Herman again, the sense of skin crawling, the feeling it had when they'd entered the fog. He sprang to his feet and pushed past the startled people crowding into the office. He had to get to Casey. Chapter 6 Redbrook House stood in its own grounds in one of the quieter roads in Andover, a school for the privileged classes. Five years before, the headmaster, Haywood, had taken on a deputy headmaster in hope of breathing new life into the school. Mr. Summers came highly recommended by one of the governing committee's members. He'd been a captain in the army during World War II and had lost an arm in the course of it. Although Hayward was disappointed by his assistant's narrow-minded educational theories, he had to admit that the man was generally very competent. But his constant carping was becoming increasingly irritating. Summers had turned the business of the crashed coach into a major issue, demanding Hodge's instant dismissal. When Hayward had confronted the wretched-looking driver, who acted as janitor, gardener, and performed countless other tasks around the school, he had admitted it was his fault, but had gone on in a surly tone to imply certain notions about the deputy head.
It was because of these implications that Hayward had decided to sack Hodges, not because of the misadventure in the fog. As for Summers, Hayward would certainly keep an eye on him. It was such a pity he had to get rid of Hodges, thought Hayward with a sigh, but good teachers were harder to replace than odd jobs.